we have uh, left for the last part of the agenda, uh, perhaps one of the more difficult issues uh, that uh, the arms control and non-proliferation regime is facing, uh, the future of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, and we're going to discuss for about 45 minutes uh, its nature, uh, what it does, and uh, its future as um, this decision by President Trump uh, in the coming weeks approaches. So as most of you recognize, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was concluded two years ago, has been blocking Tehran's pathways to nuclear weapons. The IAEA has confirmed in 10 reports Iran is complying with its commitments. Uh, yet President Donald Trump has, uh, in the view of the Arms Control Association, uh, manufactured a crisis that threatens the future of this agreement. So back in January, he announced that um, he threatened to um, not to extend U.S. sanctions waivers uh, uh, after May 12th, which is the next deadline unless Washington's uh, European partners, France, Germany, and the UK in particular, and Congress take steps to uh, fix what Trump thinks are the flaws in the deal. Uh, and so uh, now the E3 states are working with the State Department, specifically uh, Brian Hook, uh, a holdover from the Rex Tillerson State Department, uh, to explore ways in which to augment and fortify uh, the JCPOA. Um, and the May 12 deadline uh, may not be the final deadline. That is just the date by which the sanctions are supposed to be, uh, the, the sanctions waivers are supposed to be extended. It still may take some time for the Trump administration to decide to reimpose sanctions if they don't get what they're, whatever they're looking for from the, the E3. So we're going to explore these issues uh, in greater depth with two people who are uh, very familiar as um, uh, policy professionals and practitioners, and we're very pleased to have Laura Holgate and Liz Rosenberg with us. Uh, and as your program notes, um, Ambassador Laura Holgate um, is uh, a senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. She's also just rejoined the Nuclear Threat Initiative, uh, where she was before. I don't know, Laura, what your new title is. What is your new title? As of Monday, I will be Vice President for Material Security and Minimization. Ah, so Vice... Wonkiest title ever. Can we just call Even you... among my titles. Can we just call you Vice President Holgate? Would that yes, be you okay. may call me that. All right, Vice President Holgate. Um, she's also been... Um, after she did a few things at the White House over the past several years, including the Nuclear Security Summit process, she was the uh, U.S. representative to the uh, United uh, Nations international organizations, including the IAEA in Vienna. So she got to see firsthand uh, the work of the IAEA and the um, IAEA board in uh, monitoring uh, compliance with Iran's obligations. Um, and Liz Rosenberg is a senior fellow and director of the Energy, Economics, and Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Uh, and from 2009 to 2013, uh, she was a senior advisor at the Department of Treasury working on uh, sanctions issues related to Iran and other problem states. Um, and we at the Arms Control Association, Kelsey Davenport, our uh, nonproliferation policy director, and I lean on Liz many times to help understand the sanction side of the nonproliferation puzzle. And so it's very good to have Liz here because we'll be exploring uh, some of the, the details of uh, how this uh, post-May 12th period um, may, may play out. So with that, I wanted to um, start by asking uh, Laura about, uh, based on your experience at the NSC, the mission in Vienna, um, you know, what do we need to remember about where Iran was in 2012, 2013, before the interim agreement uh, that was struck that then led to the Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action? Theoretically, how close was Iran to getting enough fissile material for a weapon? In other words, why is the JCPOA important? <laughs> um, great, uh, great starting question. Um, when the negotiating process with Iran was begun, uh, the assessment was that Iran 
was two or three months from being able to create enough fissile material to use to make a weapon. Now, the experts in the room know that there's a lot of other steps between having the material, being able to weaponize it, being able to miniaturize it, being able to put it on the front end of a missile, having a missile that works. I mean, there's a lot of other steps past that, but those, the timelines for those are almost impossible to gauge. What you can gauge is how long does it take to make new, uh, fissile material and uh, in the quantities that are relevant for nuclear weapons. And so the judgment was, uh, as of 2013, that that was two to three months. And that was just too close uh, for comfort. Um, because as, as important as the technical capacity was for Iran, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, was the Iranian intention. And I think even by, you know, by, by 2013, it was well understood that Iran was not racing to a bomb. Iran was, had built a studiedly ambiguous program, a program that had some pieces that were explicitly hidden from the IAEA, other pieces that were not, um, that their goal was to be close enough to be able to sprint for a bomb if they made the decision to go to that weapon, you know, move from an ambiguous peaceful program to a, a, an intentionally weapons program. And that is an important thing to understand, that they had not yet made that decision um, as of 2013. Now, but what they did have uh, was a fair amount of uh, what we would call high assay, high assay, a, assay. High assay yes. uh, low enriched uranium. So uranium in the 19% range uh, of enrichment. And for, again, in this audience, I can talk about things like the hockey stick curve when it comes to SWU inputs. Um, in other words, it takes a lot more work to make 19% uh, highly enriched, 19% enriched uranium than it does to go from 19% to 20%. So that's where your sprint comes in. Yeah, from 19% to 90%. That's where the sprint comes in, is you're, you're pretty close. It's not linear. Um, the, so you could, so, so having that much um, material that was already close to being weapons usable was, was already uh, problematic. They also had 2,000 centrifuges spinning at two different uh, enrichment locations in Natanz and Fordo. Um, they were in the process of building the Iraq uh, heavy water reactor, which was, you know, masquerading as a as a research reactor, but it was essentially a plutonium production reactor, uh, and so that would have been a second uh, type of material that they could have used in a bomb. And they had ambitions and were were in the in the early stages of developing a reprocessing capability, which would have been needed to extract the plutonium from the spent fuel from that Iraq reactor. So they had you know, multiple different paths to achieving the kind of material that they would have needed to make a weapon uh, if they had, if, if and when, you know, this, the, the leadership of the country decided that they really needed a weapon. But they had not made that decision yet. But, but Laura, I understand that this is the worst deal ever and um, <laughs> that it really didn't I do anything. So, so that's where it was. But what, what does the JCPOA do? Um, uh, to curb those capabilities. Where are we today as a result of the, the JCPOA? So there was a lot of things that needed to happen before uh, the JCPOA actually started to, um, to take effect. And some of those were creating some irreversible, ir irreversible uh, uh, depletions of those capabilities that, that Iran had initially. First of all, was to remove all of the high assay LEU. Um, so that no longer had a starting point. Second was to limit uh, any amounts of, of LEU that they could have in, to 3.67%. Uh, so that's a significant, that, that requires then a significant amount of work to, to, to go from, from that low enrichment level to a 90% enrichment that, that you, would, you would need to make a weapon. Um, and when you only have three kilograms of it, and even if you were to start with that three kilograms of the 3.6, try to, enrich it up uh, to, to being a, a meaningful quantity from a weapons point of view, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't have enough. So that's to both the quantity and the quality uh, of, of enriched uranium uh, were importantly limited. Um, the centrifuges were dismantled um, uh, from 20,000 20, to 6,000 and uh, were put under very, very tight surveillance. Um, not just the ones that were spinning, but also the places that centrifuge parts were manufactured, the places where centrifuge R&D was going, um, and so on. The Iraq reactor was disabled. Um, I, I learned the word calandria 
um, as a result of this uh, process, and that, uh, which is essentially is a reactor vessel, it was filled with cement, permanently disabled uh, and, and damaged. Um, the heavy water was removed uh, from the country, the excess heavy water, and then limited to only a certain amount uh, that they can have. Heavy water do is not something that you can use to make uh, weapons usable material directly, but it's important for the operation of, a, of the kind of reactor that they were originally designing the Iraq reactor to be. Uh, the spent fuel that would that that had been already been generated or that will be generated in the future um, uh, associated with that reactor had to, uh, has to be removed. Um, and then the the most um, intrusive verification regime uh, ever developed was applied. Not only the additional protocol, uh, which is the uh, kind of top level of IAEA uh, safeguards that are applied to vast you know over 100 countries globally. Uh, Iran agreed to accept that level uh, on a provisional basis pending ultimate ratification of the additional protocol. But then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that the IAEA is, is confirming about Iran's behavior that is not part of what normally happens. Uh, heavy water limits, centrifuge parts, uranium mining, uranium conversion activities, um, the uh, manufacture of centrifuges, the, and, and then there's even this procurement channel uh, that is not an IAEA uh, uh, aspect, but it's a UN aspect that is a way to provide international supervision on any potentially dual use uh, equipment uh, or materials that might be going into Iran. And so there is a, an extensive uh, mechanism here. And what that has done is given everyone confidence, well, maybe not everyone, um, gave, it, it gives confidence that that two to three month period um, that we had before the JCPOA is now a one year period, that it would take Iran a year between a decision to sprint towards a weapons program, kick out the inspectors, reactivate facilities and so on. It would take them a year to manufacture enough uh, weapons usable nuclear material um, to, to make a weapon. And so that's a year in which a whole range of activities uh, all across the spectrum from uh, demarches to kinetic um, could be employed uh, were those to be determined to be the right answers. But the other thing that, that, that it did, it didn't just buy us a year of time to deal with a, an Iranian weapons decision, it gave us 10 years to and 10 years at a minimum and many much longer for other pieces of the puzzle to try to change the reality of the politics in the region. And in, the, the Iran deal was never sold as being the final end to an Iran nuclear weapons program. What it did was it bought time to change what might motivate the Iranians to choose to take a step towards a weapons program. And to, to use this time, which now is you know, down to being uh, seven and eight years <laughs> instead of the 10 years we had, to really uh, improve the politics in the Middle East that, uh, that, that a weapons decision would be a response to. And so I think, um, frankly, uh, both the previous and the current administration have not spent that time well uh, looking at the broader challenges of the politics in the region. Oh, so let's, let me just ask you about that a little bit because um, one of the uh, flaws that uh, President Trump outlined back in January 12th is uh, his criticism that uh, the JCPOA uh, expires. There are sunset provisions that will end, and that will then allow the Iranians to sprint to the bomb. So um, how do we address that problem? As you said, I mean, the JCPOA was never sold as uh, the, uh, the, the permanent solution for the potential for an Iranian nuclear weapons program. But given the realities that we have in the Middle East, which are uh, difficult, um, you know, how can we, in concept, in an ideal world, build on the deal? In other words, what would a, a smart approach be to uh, build upon the core elements of the JCPOA with Iran directly or maybe regionally? What, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, the, it's important to understand there are several uh, critical aspects of the JCPOA that are permanent, that are indefinite, that last, uh, uh, or that are, are not time limited anyway. Um, one is the uh, additional protocol. Uh, as uh, Director General uh, Yuki Amano of the International Atomic Energy Agency has said, there is no country that has successfully created a covert weapons program while under the application of the additional protocol rules. Um, so that's already uh, a, a, high, uh, a high standard there. 
Um, Iran also reiterated in its in the JCPOA the pledge that it had already undertaken in the NPT never to develop a weapons program. Uh, that lasts forever uh, <laughs> and had, has a, a, an international legally binding treaty basis because it is uh, it was a, simply a restatement of a commitment they had already made. Um, there are other aspects um, that that are you know at the much more technical level that have a much longer time frame. Um, and then as you cascade, I mean, we've all seen the waterfall charts of the timelines of what pieces expire when. I'm not going to recreate those from memory. But it's a, um, the, certainly it doesn't all end at, at 10 years. Um, much of it lasts forever. Much of it lasts longer. Um, and the, the, the rational thing to think about is as you approach those dates with a solid track record, either a solid track record of implementation and verification and compliance, which is what we have until now, um, or concerns about verification and compliance, then when you get to year eight or nine is the time to start talking about, you know, what do we need to do differently if, if this agreement is going to continue? And you also have to base it on the political context at the time. What is the, the broader political environment in the Middle East? Uh, what are the, the threats or perceived threats to which Iran's uh, weapons decisions or ambivalence decisions might be responding. Um, but to try to jump from you know year two or three of implementation to already thinking about what are you going to change in year 10 uh, is vastly premature. Yeah, OK. So one other question for you, and I'm going to switch to some questions about the, the future of the agreement and, and, and bring Liz into the conversation. But uh, you know, you were working at the White House on these issues, you're part of the the, the meetings and the discussions backstopping the talks that Wendy Sherman and others led. And then you were at the IAEA looking at how the, 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 the agency was working this. Um, now, now Donald Trump and his team says that the mechanisms for inspections that the JCPOA allows for, including the additional protocol and the other measures, that's not enough. And we need to have a more robust inspection authority. And we need to get the Europeans to agree with us. What's your reaction to that? What does the agency itself say about whether it needs more inspection authority, whether there's been resistance that is preventing them from uh, verifying Iranian compliance? Well, first of all, I'm going to set your characterization straight a little bit because there's too many people here in the room who know I had nothing to do with the Iran deal until I went to Vienna. So <laughs> I, was okay. not, right. I was not part of that back, back, backstopping team, but um, I did see it. Uh, on the ground in Vienna, uh, the work directly with uh, the IAEA safeguards teams, uh, the close cooperation that those teams had with the experts on my team in the US mission there, the reach back capability we had to the US national laboratories to answer technical questions that were coming from the, uh, from the safeguards community uh, within the secretariat at the IAEA. Um, and I, I have to say, it's the, to see the level of professionalism uh, from a technical point of view, from a judgment point of view, uh, from the safeguards team uh, all the way up to DG Amano on this issue uh, was, was quite impressive. Um, they were always responsive to issues that the U.S. brought forward. Uh, we tried to be as quickly and as quickly responsive to any technical questions that, that they brought forward, uh, and there was a, a real transparency uh, on the implementation process while respecting appropriately uh, the safeguards confidentiality of certain types of information that the safeguards inspectors would have, uh, uh, would have had access to uh, inside Iran. Um, so uh, the, I, I, it was never raised by, in any of those conversations from the safeguards community inside Iran, or inside the IAEA it says, oh, gee, we wish, we wish we could do this. Or if only we had this information, we would be able to say this with more certainty um, or anything like that. We invented some new technology for them, the, the, famous, um, um, the famous enrichment uh, level monitoring um, event, uh, contraption. Yes, OLM. Um, I'm out of practice talking about this. The, um, the online enrichment monitoring um, device, uh, which actually derived from an old from, from a U.S. Russian uh, gizmo that had been inv invented in the connection with the HEU purchase agreement and the blend down of the 500 metric tons of, of Russian highly enriched uranium. So, 
we did have a little bit of an interesting moment of, of, a, of a US Russian technology being now applied in, in a third country environment, which is, which is pretty cool. And kudos to the Oak Ridge folks uh, who were the ones who, who uh, were able to make that extrapolation. Um, certain, and the JCPOA also provides some mechanical capacity over and above the traditional safeguards in terms of creating a snapback uh, arrangement the, to, to bolster the ability, the, the, bolster the additional protocols ability to have the IAE inspectors visit any site at which they had a concern. And so whereas that exists for any uh, additional protocol, um, if, if the host country chooses to draw out that conversation, then there's a potential that it could last too long to be useful. Uh, for the purposes of the Iran deal, there's a very specific time-limited decision-making process if, in fact, the IAEA does not get adequately, quickly satisfaction from, from Iran that actually creates automatic snapback of sanctions, uh, so a pretty heavy hammer uh, should, should Iran uh, challenge the IAEA's rights uh, under the AP. They, the IAEA has not asked to see military facilities uh, because they have had no concern about that. Iran has not refused any particular visits to any military facilities uh, in association with the JCPOA. So I think those are two important facts to, to be sure that uh, are registered. So I want to bring Liz into the conversation. I want to ask both of you this same question to get your reactions. Um, as I mentioned, there's this May 12th sanctions waiver extension deadline, and uh, the EU three parties and the Trump administration are negotiating on ways to, for lack of a better way of putting it, augment the, the JCPOA outside of the, the nuclear provisions. And as we understand it, it's been reported, um, this is kind of a three-part negotiation on Iran's ballistic missile activities, which fall outside the JCPOA itself, on the uh, regional behavior of Iran and how the US and Europe might cooperate, uh, and on the so-called sunset provisions, the, the, some of the elements in the JCPOA that relate to nuclear that might expire, and what do they do together? So. You know, in, in, in essence, what do you expect might come out of this? What can come out of it? Um, and what needs to be avoided uh, over the coming week? So it's a very open question. I don't, Liz, or you, you might want to start, and, and, and Laura can jump in. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to be here with you and to have this conversation. Um, so, what comes out of this conversation? Uh, well, there's a set of things that have already come out of it and then may come out of it. Uh, pursuant to further discussions that uh, the State Department, led by Brian Hook, uh, is having with counterparts uh, in the E3 political directors and their deputies. And also those same, the E3 are having conversations with members of Congress and uh, committees of jurisdiction or who are clearly stakeholders on this issue. That's not part of a formal U.S. administration E3 process seeking um, a statement, a joint statement or a joint uh, piece of paper or a um, a joint press conference. It could any of those things are possible. That the goal is to try and bring together in some slightly more formalized way the United States and the E3 to uh, with an agreement about how to address these three things. So, interestingly, um, I think that the it appears that the U.S. position, the what the U.S. administration was asking for from the E3 when it comes to ballistic missiles and regional activity, uh, may be less than what the E3 was willing to do. Uh, so, cross that off the list. The, the, I, there's an ample opportunity to get to yes there when it comes to those particular people having a conversation. And when we're talking about ballistic missile behavior, we're talking about ballistic missile transfers from Iran to other parties, right? I mean, just to be more specific. There's two sets of concerns. Obviously, the expansion of their own arsenal and um, uh, technology, equipment, procurement, testing. procurement agents, t testing, absolutely. And then as well as uh, proliferating that technology to other interested customers. Um, right, so all of that is there. And Europe has a, at the level of the EU as well as individual member states, has a long history of interest and concern on this issue. They have plenty of their own sanctions on Iran related to ballistic missiles that exist now in the era of the JCPOA. So there's a lot of opportunity for them to do more there. I understand that the really difficult part is how to get to an agreement on this sunset issue. And to make it particularly challenging, there's a couple of factors here, a couple of considerations. One is that the US administration, I think what they're looking for is the word sanctions, an intent to, for Europe to use sanctions uh, if 
and you can offer the technical uh, lingo to, to fill this out, but my understanding is if uh, Iran steps out of the bounds that begin to expire after the expiration date, that's a simple vernacular I've tried to use in this, but um, you can amplify that. But, uh, and um, uh, the challenge here is that uh, I think some of the European counterparts are allergic to using those words. That's very uncomfortable. And to get into a place where there is um, the, the interpretation on the European side is if you go so far as to say that uh, that will happen or there is an intent for that to happen, that uh, is broadly perceived there to be um, uh, rewriting the agreement. And that's, that's just a no-no. Uh, it's too politically uncomfortable, um, and and there's not a. And furthermore, I think they're they take very seriously the challenge of committing their future governments to this obligation, which I think is much more lightly undertaken here in the United States. Anyway, um, then there's the other uh, challenge, which is what the White House uh, ultimately says about an, any agreement that the State Department manages to get to with E3 counterparts and whether notwithstanding the fact that the E3 and the State Department may come to agreement on these three issues, including the sunset issue, whether that will be palatable and sufficient for the president. And that's something that no one can answer period. <laughs> so um, that, of course, is quite a disincentive for Europeans to exert a lot of effort and political capital, including getting to an uncomfortable place with some of their own domestic constituencies on this issue. And viewing that, other European states have thrown up uh, barriers and difficulties to adoption at the EU level of new measures to advance these, partic these particular concerns in the form of sanctions at the EU. So that makes it more difficult too. I, I do perceive that in the last week or two, there's been a doubling down of effort on the part of the Europeans to try and work with the Americans, also um, indirectly with the US Congress, this set of important um, uh, pace setters or policy shapers in, on the Hill to try very hard to come to a set of agreements which no one has guarantees will ultimately succeed with the president. But nevertheless, people are working very hard on these three issues. Thanks. So Laura, what, what do you think can be accomplished, what should be avoided, perhaps avoided by our European partners who are trying to uphold this agreement? Um, I think a, a good faith showing as they are doing, I think that's that's the critical part of it. I, I completely agree with Liz. The We don't know, nobody knows where the goalposts are or whether they will move um, even when they've been stated, uh, whether they will stay where they've been put. Um, and so it's, it just it incredibly complicates the effort. Um, the, and I, I, I worry very much, I mean, this is more in, in Liz's bailiwick, but that the, the kinds of secondary sanctions and other things that might start to happen if we, if we can't find a common perspective will bust open what has been, to me, a remarkably durable common perspective, not just with US and the Europeans, but with China and Russia as well. Yeah. Um, and so I, if, we, if we mess with that, <laughs> that really starts to tear away at the uh, coherence of th that we saw when Iran was kind of challenging the boundaries, you know, in, in the, the 2016 time frame of the agreement and where they, they faced a, you know, impenetrable wall of opprobrium from the other members of the P5 plus one. If we start, you know, if the U.S. And, and Europe start to come apart a little bit, uh, then I, I worry very much about the ability to keep a common perspective against any future efforts of Iran to test boundaries or, you know, worse yet, go past them. And I would just note, uh, just this morning, there was a very significant statement that came out uh, from Europe, 500 French, German, uh, UK parliamentarians issuing a call, I think, directed to the US Congress urging them to do what they can to ensure the United States uh, does not violate the JCPOA, stays in the agreement. Uh, and a couple of days ago, uh, EU High Representative Federico Mogherini making a very clear statement that uh, the EU will 
uh, follow through and uphold uh, the JCPOA and defend the JCPOA. But still, there are only a certain number of things that can be done. Um, and so I wanted to turn to Liz to um, the question uh, of, you know, what will happen if we, if what we expect does happen, which is that President Trump fails to extend the uh, sanctions waivers that um, would have to happen on the 12th of May or maybe earlier, uh, would that put the U.S. in technical violation of the JCPOA from a legal perspective? What's your thoughts? Um, and what would the international reaction be at that point? Um, and particularly, perhaps, your thoughts about Iran. And Laura, if you want to talk about this, too. Because uh, what is today? The 19th. OK, this is just two weeks away. Your thoughts? Well, when you put it like that. Um, <laughs> uh, so as a purely legal matter, um, if the uh, president comes up to uh, May 12th and hasn't rolled over, and by the way, this is a delegated authority. It wouldn't be him who signs the thing anyway. But obviously, it's so significant politically that he has to approve that this should happen. If the administration uh, does not renew they are the set of 120-day waivers offering a set of relief uh, from sanctions to an array of non-US companies, uh, then technically all of that activity that had been permitted is no longer permitted, which means that if you continue to do it, it's a violation of, uh, of these silent, of these sanctions, and there's uh, civil and criminal liability associated with that. So there are some people who are peddling the notion that it's not illegal until it's enforced, which is sort of like saying it's not illegal to speed unless the cop comes and pulls you over. So <laughs> it's still illegal as a legal matter. Now, I will offer that um, if that particular scenario happens, so we get to May 12th and the sanctions waivers, those waivers are not rolled over, it will be incredibly confusing legally to um, uh, an array, uh, to the whole world that might actually be interested in complying with US law and staying on the right side of the US for purposes of using the dollar in the US economy, which basically describes just about everyone in that 80% of global trade transactions are conducted in the dollar. And I don't have to explain the full significance to you all. But uh, so that sets up a situation where um, there's lots of uh, there's lots of liability. The administration will have to explain whether that uh, shall be effectuated, shall go into effect um, uh, in 180 days. And uh, there's a number of 180 day markers that probably indicate that would be a reasonable default. Uh, there's a piece of guidance that the Obama administration put out in January 2016 that said it was full, it was a long QA about all of the things, uh, questions about how these sanctions are rolled off as part of the JCPOA and planted in there way at the end uh, is a question well, what happens if sanctions are reimposed? And it says there'll be a 180 day period where these wind up. And so if you have a, a many kinds of contracts that are in practice, you can continue and uh, execute the contract, and then you've got to get out, et cetera. The Trump administration doesn't have to be bound by that. Uh, they doesn't have to be 180 days. And some of the sanctions uh, that would, uh, these 120-day ones that are tied to that May 12th deadline, uh, they are uh, energy sanctions, so they bear relevance to Iran's ability to sell its petroleum. Uh, and uh, they created, when they were in force, the requirement for six remaining significant purchasers of Iranian oil to, quote, significantly reduce their amount of petroleum purchases every 180 days. So there's another 180-day marker that might mean that after 180 days after May 12th, um, uh, these purchasers of Iranian oil would have to show themselves to be significantly reducing it, et cetera. You, you, you see where I'm going. This is, there's a lot of questions about who this applies to, because in 2012, Europe wasn't purchasing Iranian oil. No, now they are. they are. So there's, yes, you, you take, the, so the, the short of this is, yes, the US would be in violation come um, uh, May 12th. 
And I think political uh, um, counterparts of the United States and independent observers and lawyers the world over will point that out. And it'll also start having a real world effect on the trade investment um, that is going on yeah. and will contribute to Iran's argument, which is becoming more and more valid, that the United States is taking actions that are contrary to its obligations to uh, relieve it of the sanctions. And um, so, um, Laura, let me just come back to you about, uh, I mean, this is a speculative question, but I think it's an important one to consider given where all this is headed is, you know, Iran has these latent capabilities that were pulled back, decreased because of the JCPOA. What kinds of things might the Iranians do if this keeps going in this direction? Um, just real quick, what, what might we look forward to if we don't find a way out of this uh, dead end? Well, just like with U.S. policy, there's been a number of different Iranian policies stated in public. Um, and some have said that, some Iranian voices have said that they will continue to comply uh, with the JCPOA focusing on the Europeans and, and Chinese and, and Russians uh, continued observance uh, of, of that. I don't know what that means <laughs> regarding secondary sanctions, but there's, there was at least that statement. Um, more recently, there's been a statement that they would not continue to comply. They themselves would feel unbound, unlimited by the constraints of the JCPOA if the U.S. pulls out, irrespective of what any of the, any of the other parties do. And then there's also been statements that they will return, you know, they can return, uh, you know, as quickly, they will return as quickly as they possibly can to the level of capacity and or even more um, uh, that they had for either the uranium path or the plutonium path uh, to, to the bomb. Um, they have, again, some of these constraints were, uh, were permanent, but there are workarounds if they are not under the, under the supervision and verification implications of the JCPOA. And so that's where the one year comes in. So we have a year mm. to prepare. And it all goes back to what is Iran's intent. Do, you know, if, they were, if they were not yet intent on making a weapon in 2013, if they validated that lack of intent in the text uh, and the actions associated with the JCPOA, does the U.S. departure change their calculation about that intent? Do they decide that now that the U.S. is no longer using diplomacy uh, to try to achieve the, the, the U.S. goals, that the next, the, the next ratchet is you know, not just through sanctions, but to something kinetic? Okay. Uh, do they decide that that is the trigger that will actually cause them to cross that path that they, that they have not crossed uh, in, in the last uh, 15 or more years? So can I just respond? Yeah. To that? So um, just to add a little more, it's obviously <laughs> not the U.S. and Iran, and you know whose whose race is it to to double down on the threat? When um, when several weeks back we heard um, from the, I think it was Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran say, you know, well we're 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 going to move towards the towards a, a nuclear weapons capacity. We heard. The same thing said by the Saudis. Right. So, uh, so there, it's not just two actors here. We're watching for uh, the potential to escalate, and uh, and and that's probably just the beginning of the universe of uh, in actors who are planning to make mischief in a scenario where the U.S. and and European allies are divided, and where there's um, a much more um, uncertain. Uh, uh, perspective on nuclear arms control globally and also uh, as a security measure in the Middle East. No, I think that's just right. And yeah. for if anyone who is worried about Saudi's interest in nuclear weapons, the best possible thing you can do is preserve the JCPOA in that it at least delays uh, and creates an opportunities to adjust uh, Iran's path right. uh, towards a bomb. So, and that's um, an argument that Kingston Reef and I and, and Kelsey have been making in connection with the coming congressional debate on the proposed Saudi 123 agreement. And well, before I get to the next question about what we can do about the situation, what the Europeans can do, um, I mean, let me just comment to, to, to bring this conversation very briefly back to the beginning of the day and the discussion about the NPT and the future of the NPT and the upcoming PrepCom on the 2020 review conference. Um, I think it's fair to say, I think I'm channeling Ambassador Higgy, the threat to the NPT if uh, is, is not the ban treaty, the threat to the NPT is the possibility that the North Korean nuclear problem continues to get further out of hand. And if this, this fix to the nonproliferation regime, which is the JCPOA, is removed, we're, we're opening 
a Pandora's box in the Middle East. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear and obvious. And so I hope this is something that in Geneva that is raised by a number of delegations because uh, we need to connect these, these dots. Um, so let me just come back to, to Liz. Um, uh, and I'm going to ask a question I don't know the answer to. I don't know. I, I think she's got a better chance of answering this question. It's sort of unanswerable. But you know, if we head towards in this direction, uh, you know, what kinds of measures can our European allies, the E3 and the EU28 as a whole, and maybe the, the Chinese and the, the Russians take in order to sustain the trade and investment that would be necessary to persuade the Iranians that staying in this deal is worthwhile? I mean, that's what Laura was referring to. So, I mean, what, what particular um, legal financial mechanisms are possible? Um, and, yeah, so. I, I don't have great news for you. So um, I um, realistically, I don't think there's much viability for Europeans uh, as the EU or on a national level to create um, a protected channel or a white channel um, with Iran to try and um, safeguard some commercial activity and payment um, from U.S. sanctions. Uh, same thing with other with other attempts at um, the, revising their blocking legislation, which would uh, safeguard or prevent uh, companies uh, that are legal persons in the EU from abiding by uh, non-national sanctions law, which is to say U.S. law. And the reason why is that any company of reasonable size, so even a regional European company, um, wants access to use the dollar, even if they don't plan on having U.S. commercial counterparts, and they want to be able to avail themselves of U.S. technology, which is ubiquitous uh, from everything from human resources software applications uh, to um, industrial process software. I mean, the universe is very broad here, um, as well as U.S natural persons, like uh, any of you who might offer them counsel, legal counsel, strategic advice. I mean, all of that is not, not permitted if, uh, if you're on the wrong end of the sanctions um, uh, uh, and enforcement action. So uh, no reasonable company wants to be made the test case of this, even if their governments want to stand up because they are very frustrated legitimately at being bullied by the United States and asked to capitulate on strongly held domestic issues, which, by the way, might cost them their political you know, mandate and, and viability and standing where they are in Europe. But nevertheless, the only um, such uh, white channels that have existed have been within the boundaries of uh, sanctions programs. So in tightest Iran sanctions in you know, 2012 on, uh, in those years, there were white channels for permitted purchases of Iranian oil and certain South Korean and Japanese and, and Indian bank. Um, and uh, after great uh, struggle and uh, tedious legal work, uh, it, ha it does occur when doing things like trying to deliver aid money to uh, aid workers in Syria, et cetera. But uh, this only comes with the blessing of the regulators and enforcement officers in the United States. So I can't, I cannot see that happening. So uh, unfortunately, my takeaway from that is it is even more important to try every last chance to keep this deal in place because that future looks like the only people who will continue to do business are uh, people interested, interested in um, violating the sanctions intentionally or circumventing them in some way or pushing China faster towards a non-US, because they, they can't really do this in Europe, but China could with the volume and liquidity and available bank funds, and they've done it before and were sanctioned for it under the Iran sanctions regime, to create a kind of carve out a, uh, a bank that will only do Iran business, for example, uh, to permit Chinese or other entities to be able to do that in violation of US sanctions. Okay, well, I told you at the beginning of the day this was not going to necessarily be an uplifting conference by the time that we were done. And those little, uh, those little tins, um, unfortunately, have mints in them. They don't have little Xanax pills. So <laughs> we can't make you instantly happy. But I want to give, give uh, you folks a chance to uh, ask a couple of questions. We're, we're running short on time. 
Um, raise your hands. I want to encourage people who have not uh, asked a question before. Uh, in the middle, Ryan, um, if uh, there's this gentleman with a mustache who I know is very knowledgeable about uh, Ed Levine, uh, <laughs> these issues. All right, Ryan, to him, please. You used. Oh, my goodness, you've shaved it. Okay. Ed. Edward Levine, Your question. Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. I just wonder, uh, in the event that the agreement falls apart or is perceived to be falling apart, what is to prevent Russia from repatriating the enriched uranium to Iran? Laura, real quick. <laughs> Nothing. And what, how would that affect? the uh, timelines for a sprint? It, it would certainly shrink them significantly. Um, whether Russia really has an incentive to do that is a different question. Um, but there, there's nothing as long as it goes, you know, is kind of part of safeguards uh, activity within Iran, you know, that's, that's okay. Yeah, and I would just add as we get, Mallory, you want to take the next question, please? Um, I mean, one other thing to think about is, you know, Russia, has since the JCPOA begun lining up um, agreements with Iran for uh, the construction of Russian reactors and the supply of Russian fuel to Iran, which would obviate the, uh, the need, the economic need for Iran to reconstitute an enrichment, a domestic enrichment program. So it's very much in Russia's financial interest, not to mention a security interest, to keep the deal in place because right. they're not going to you know, Iran's not going to need the Russian fuel if they can produce their own. Mallory Stewart, your question. Thank you. Um, I apologize in advance for a little bit of a leading question, but it's to Ambassador Holgate. Given your experience internationally um, with this agreement and with other countries' reactions to it, um, and given the talk this morning about the DPRK watching every move that happens with the JCPOA, more broadly, do you see any lasting and long-term effects to the U.S.'s credibility as an, as an entity that, that can engage in political commitments that have been important throughout the history of arms control um, moving forward, right? In, in, in terms of some of our most important agreements, political agreements, have been non-binding. And how can countries take us seriously if from administration to administration we give up that capacity to allow for continuity? Well, I, I just, even, even in 2016, uh, when I was in Vienna, I was hearing from my ambassadorial counterparts, uh, you know, concern about, you know, the uncertainty that might come along with a change of U.S. administration and what that would mean for their ability to have confidence in my successor, who, by the way, is among those ambassadors that has not yet been able to take up post. Um, so we, we have an extremely capable uh, charge d'affaires, but we have no ambassador in the IAEA to be sitting you know, with, felt, with counterparts, uh, with the DG, uh, having you know, the kind of conversations that it takes an ambassador to have uh, about what to expect, how to mitigate the fallout, sorry, the damage. Um, and, uh, fallout works in this. <laughs> Um, so I think uh, both very tactically in terms of the next few months in Vienna and also and especially in the NPT space when we have a whole bunch of challenging conversations coming up there, you, you know, how can, how, how can in fact the U.S. be taken seriously when there is no problem with the, with the performance against the agreement? That is the biggest concern. When the U.S. has problems, I mean, I, there's been a lot of debate about the INF Treaty, but there, you know, we can say what our problem is with it. Um, this, this is, you know, it's a fully functioning, uh, complied with agreement by all relevant parties, and even then we can't be trusted to stick with it. And that, I think, significantly undermines our credibility as a partner, as a leader, uh, as a um, champion of norms that have been bipartisan since their very origins. We would be remiss if we didn't just note that, and I think we can all agree, this is actually just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what, we are, what we ought to be, and in fact, let's not miss the forest for the trees, the broad concern is that the U.S. and its traditional closest security allies risk losing little, you know, what shred is left of credibility and trust on an array of economic and security issues that they, there's an entire global legal political strategic framework built around close cooperation of these on an array of topics, and that's the, the bigger cost we, we must bear in mind. 
All right, well, that's going to have to be where we end this conversation on the future and, and the challenges on the Joint Conference of Plan of Action. I want to thank you both for giving us a, a hard dose of reality, laying out the issues. Um, we're going to, the Arms Control Association, continue to work with um, uh, Liz and Laura and many other colleagues in this room uh, to try to encourage the White House and others to uh, see the light on this. Um, and we will uh, continue to churn out our analysis and our information uh, with the leadership of uh, Kelsey Davenport, our Nonproliferation Policy Director, and others. But we're about to close our meeting today. Um, and before we, I turn it over to Tom Countryman, who's going to give us some closing remarks. I want to ask you two to stay here. And I just wanted to say, before uh, Tom comes up, that um, uh, the organization has been uh, working under very difficult conditions um, over the last couple of years as this array of issues has come forward at us. Uh, problems relating to the US-Russia arms control framework, the problems uh, facing the JCPOA, the increasingly dangerous North Korean issue, the tensions and stresses on the NPT regime, the lack of progress on the CTBT, the violations of the chemical weapons norm. It's been the most uh, challenging period, I think, I can say in the history of the organization since uh, the, the Cold War days. But the staff of this organization has been extremely professional. They've worked extremely hard. Uh, we've had a tremendous response from our board of directors providing advice and support and leadership. Uh, we've had a great deal of uh, support, additional support coming from our small but loyal set of members. Uh, for those of you who are coming to these meetings, you'll note that the number of foundations now supporting the organization uh, and the number of sponsors of this meeting is up. Um, so uh, we are working as best we can, and we appreciate your support. And, and I especially appreciate Tom Countryman coming on board as our board chair to spend his retirement um, time, uh, not so retired. Uh, he is working mm -hmm. steadily and has really fortified our capacity uh, and has provided, I think, uh, a real shot in the arm to all of us and to the board of directors. So with that, Tom Countryman, please close us out, and we'll stay up here <laughs> while Tom does. Let's, let's applaud for Elizabeth. <laughs>